Newman. All right, we're here with David Newman, founder of RX Smart Gear. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate it. So before we hopped on, you were saying how you guys started the company in 2009, over 11 years ago. Is this something where, you know, 11 years later, you're like, wow, we're still in business? Because I think people forget how hard it is to have a startup, have a small business like like this, be it a, be it a jump rope company to begin with or, or a CrossFit affiliate. Yeah, every day. I mean, you, you, you hit it on the head. Every day it really is a gift, you know, that we're, we're able to do this. And uh, especially, it was just never intentional. This was such an accidental thing to happen. And uh, I know you, you've been around CrossFit, uh, you know, quite a few years longer than me. And so back, back in the early day, I started in 08. Um, you know, it was so raw and, and uh, new. Um, and the jump rope thing was merely a garage hobby. Uh, that just caught on and caught wildfire and it was just the right time, right place, you know, so super lucky. And every day we're, we're super stoked to, to still be doing it. And, and uh, yeah, man, it's great. When you, when you say it was accidental in 2008, 2009, I mean, the only place I remember being able to get a jump rope was a, a site by the guy named Buddy Lee, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Very familiar and with Buddy Lee. He's a legend. He is a legend. So, what made you, what prompted you to say, okay, we could do this better? Yeah. So it wasn't even a matter of we could do this better. It was like, why do I suck so bad? You know, that was my, and I know a lot of people experience that, you know, they think they're relatively athletic and they find that one movement that's just their, their, um, you know, tripping point, you know, they, whether it's a muscle up or a snatch, you know, double unders for me, um, well, all those other things are tough for me too, but double unders back in the day, uh, made no sense that I would be so bad at them because I was fairly coordinated and comfortable with a jump rope. I had just never been introduced to double unders, you know? So, um, you know, it was a matter of trying to figure out my own issues and just delving into that. That's why I poured so much intention and passion into figuring out for myself It was a very selfish endeavor. Um, and, uh, you know, Buddy Lee, great product. I mean, there's so many great products out there. Buddy Lee had one of the premier jump ropes. I mean, I really credit him with, you know, coming out with probably the first quality jump rope, you know, like, a, you know, an expensive jump rope, not a cheap little $2 off the, off the shelf, you know. Uh, I, and I think younger CrossFitters don't get it. Like, when we started, they, you would buy, like, a rope that had a wooden handle and it had, like, that nylon white rope yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't get it to spin fast, so you couldn't do double unders with it. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, that was the thing. So, um, and the thing with, uh, I credit Buddy Lee with kind of helping me, uh, you know, start my business. And I don't mean this in a bad way whatsoever because I love his product. I love what he's done. Uh, and, and all the products out there are, are great, you know, for what they're intended for. The, and Buddy Lee was one of the first ropes that was hanging on our gym wall. So I've been a member at CrossFit East County here in San Diego. Uh, they've been an affiliate since 07. Um, our owner, Paul Flores, wonderful guy. He's been in the games twice. Like the very first year they had a master's category in 2010. He qualified in that class uh, at Carson and, uh, and got on the podium, took third that year. So a uh, little, little shout out to him because, you know, again, being in his environment and him being so receptive and letting me tinker around and, and use members to kind of test things out um, is, uh, you know, I, I owe him a lot, a lot of credit. So, but with Buddy Lee's ropes was one of the smattering of ropes hanging on the wall, just like most gyms, you know, have. Um, and what happens with a Buddy Lee rope it, it, with the cord is that when it's the gummy cord is as they age, and I don't know how old this particular rope was, but as they age, they get real flexible, right? And real stretchy. And that's one of the things I discovered was, was causing me an issue that I couldn't control. My skill level, you know, wasn't adept enough is that when you have something that's too flexible, as you're spinning it around you, you know, the faster you spin it, the more it expands. When you start slowing down, it starts contracting. If you don't know how to adjust your hands to compensate, you, that's what causes the trips. And so uh, I like, I really like the weight of his, the cord. It was just too flexible, especially that particular one. So um, I gravitated to the, you know, a metal cord or, um, wire, you know, steel wire basically with plastic coating. 
And back at that time, what was most prevalent were really just speed wires, right? Because speed ropes have been around for quite a while as well. Just the thin little speed wires that you still see it's super popular today. Um, but that was too light, you know, they just, that was too light and flimsy that you didn't have enough resistance to really gauge what was happening around you. You had to spin it fast in order to get the feeling of resistance, but now you're moving too fast to coordinate your time and your jump, you know? So it was really a matter of slowing things down and creating a static environment where you could control your variables. And so it was really just kind of tinkering and fusing those, those thought processes together um, and came up with a rope that started working really well for me. And of course, buddies in the gym were like, you know, I used to be the laughing stock, and then people started seeing me get better. Um, and then they'd want to try my rope, and then they would get better. And then, you know, and then they'd ask me to make them one. So I'd make them one, and it just snowballed from there, man. So it was, it was, uh, yeah, totally an accident. Um, and we're just super, super stoked to, to still be going at it. I mean, those are how some of the best businesses start, right? You're doing things, you know, I, I once heard it's like, it has to be either unique or meaningful. And it sounds right. like, well, a jump rope's not unique. It's meaningful in that this is what really took it to the next level. And typically it's like no different than some of the, you know, RX bar is a great example, right? Somebody's right. making bars in their basement selling it for, you know, a half a billion dollars a few years later. So oh, I know. Awesome you, story. What was your background prior to making jump ropes? So uh, athletically, my wife and I uh, have a background in gymnastics. We both coached gymnastics, uh, club gymnastics for quite a few years, like over a decade each. Uh, that's how we met. We actually met coaching at San Diego State uh, where they had a club program. They no longer had a collegiate program, uh, but they, they kept a facility in a, in a club program, a booster run club program that was real high level, had some really good kids coming out of there. So. Uh, coached gymnastics for quite a while, and uh, but professional. So that's kind of what led itself into analyzing the the jump rope movement and kind of breaking it down uh, using that perspective. But uh, professionally, I uh, right out of college from coaching gymnastics up and through college, and right out of college, I kind of got involved with the family business in real estate and uh, did that for uh, like 17 years. Um, you know, before I found CrossFit and kind of gravitated a little bit of overlap in there, but then uh, gravitated into CrossFit and tinkering with this. And this kind of took a life of its own. And um, it took about a year and a half to two years to, you know, kind of leave that career and go full time into this. So, um, yeah, so I've been full time in running the company since probably. 20 between 2010 2011 ish is when I just completely stopped doing any real estate you know I uh, I still had people working under me in real estate so I was still their broker uh, kind of overseeing what they were doing I wasn't servicing my own clients anymore um, but then I got to a point to where I just really wanted to put 100% energy into this so uh, I you know helped them find new places to, to land and uh, completely got out of that business entirely around that time. Well, I want to kind of split the interview into two major topics. I want to have a business chat, and then I want to hear about you from a coaching perspective, because the double under is one of the hardest movements to teach, see, and correct. But from a yet business perspective, yet the what's that? Movement. I said, yet, but the easiest movement, really, when you look at what's required, it's really one of the easiest movements once it's broken in, down. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and, and funny story, you know, Every weekend at the CrossFit Level 1, we have a lecture called What is Fitness? And we, and we talk a lot about the balance, accuracy, agility, and coordination. And when I give that lecture, I'll, I'll poll the audience and I'll say, hey, who doesn't have double unders? And inevitably, a handful of people will raise their hand and I'll ask one of them to stand up and, hey, can you bounce up and down? Yeah, I can do that. Can you do that? And can you spin your wrists? Yeah, well, you can do double unders. Exactly. You know? And I didn't know it at the time, but I actually did that to a girl who turned out, you know, a few years later to be my wife. So <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm glad for the double under, you know, it was my, awesome. first, uh, my first flirting with my wife. But what a great story. Are, are you the 100% owner of RX Mark here? My wife and I are, yeah. We, we both, we both uh, own and run the company together, yeah. So. But, but between, you know, the Newman family, it's, it's, you haven't brought on outside investors. No, 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 no. Completely uh, homegrown, self-funded. Um, yep, just us. 
Was that a easier, hard decision? I'm sure there were times where you're like, man, if we just had an influx of six figures coming in, we can really take this thing even further. Did you have to really make a conscious decision to not allow outside investors? Right, right. Well, um, you know, a couple of things. Number one, back then, nobody was knocking on the door, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I probably wasn't smart enough really to go out and hunt for it. But no, actually, uh, and, and, you know, that timing was just literally the perfect storm, right? The, the timing was just ripe. Uh, looking back on it now, at the time, I didn't know. At the time, I thought it was a joke. Like, really? I, my business is going to be making jump ropes? You know, I mean, I came out of real estate where your real estate commissions, you know, buying and selling homes or what have you could be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a paycheck. Uh, and yet now I'm going to sell a jump rope, which at the time for like 30 bucks a pop, you know, something like that. Um, it just was really not fathomable to me. Uh, I really thought it was just a hobby. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, what kind of happened, I mean, there were a few little things along the way that created little, glitches that gave us a jump start you know one of them was uh one of my my workout buddies joe craig who uh was with me for 10 years you know young guy at the time and uh you know he was just my training partner and i would make a jump rope or make a couple of them bring them in give him one i'd use one you know we would test them out compare notes and i'd go back and rework it retweak it whatever change some things out change the sizing come back, he and I would train with them. And, you know, so, um, so uh, his wife, his wife was the one that said, Hey, you should uh, put these on Facebook and see if other people are interested in buying them. And I said, great. I don't know what that is, but why don't you set it up for me? So I wasn't on social media back in, you know, Oh nine. And so, uh, so his wife set up a Facebook page and we took photographs of, uh, you know, some of uh, our different jump ropes and, and, uh, and put it out on, on Facebook and didn't run ads, didn't pay for any paid advertising. It was so organic. And we really didn't know what we were doing. I don't even know if they had paid ads back then. They, they, they probably did, but, um, yeah, I don't know if they did. Yeah. But you know, started getting sales kind of with a, a few sales, like across the, across the country, um, from different folks. So that was uh, one little, um, spike. And then, you know, Justin Judkins had uh, CrossFit radio. I know you remember I that. I know Justin. Yeah, I was on that show quite a few times. I'm sure you were. Justin's awesome. Yeah, I love him. So um, Justin had had me on and um, we had a nice chat. And it was funny because after I was on his show, I was sitting at home on the sofa and uh, and probably making jump ropes because we, you know, we actually ran the business out of our house for about two and a half years. We were, we, we ran the business uh, out of the home and um and uh, so I was at home and my I had a Blackberry at the time, if you remember what Blackberries were, and that started going off, right, with orders. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, holy shit, there's an order from Sweden. And, holy cow, there's another one from Spain. So that's when I realized Justin had such a huge audience across overseas that people in over overseas wanted to know what was going on in the CrossFit world back here in California, which was, you know, the, the birthplace and the Mecca at the time. Uh, so, so that was huge. Um, the other thing was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Amic, Amic Jones, who works for, uh, Rogue, but yes. Amic, yeah, used to own CrossFit SoCal here in San Diego. And, uh, he hosted, uh, he hosted our sectionals back in 2010, back that's that right. point, one year we had sectionals. So I competed in that and, uh, and you know, we went a couple days early to meet him and offer to help out. Like, hey, do you need any help setting up or do you need any equipment we could bring over? Whatever, you know, just trying to, you know, fuse the community. And um, Amic was awesome. And I brought him a gift. I go, hey, I brought this jump rope for you. You know, you should, uh, you should try it out. And, uh, and he did. He literally unraveled it, started jumping with it hit a double under PR, hit a hundred plus double unders. And he was just like blown away, you know? And he, and at the time he was working uh, kind of part-time with, with Bill and Katie <clears throat> because Amit had started his own kind of online uh, equipment business. It was really just kind of like mail order. He would just pull in other uh, kettlebells and med balls and things from different uh, uh, wholesale shops, put them together in a package and resell them. Uh, online and and then Bill kind of hooked up with him and said, "Hey, why don't you come work for us? We'll just fuse everything together." 
So um, at the time, Amit owned Cross of SoCal, but he was a Navy radiologist. So he's a Navy doctor. So the guy just had tons of stuff going on. And uh, anyway, he said, Dave, these are amazing. You need to show these to Bill and Katie. And I'm like, okay, you know, and, and so he made the introduction, uh, showed them the product. Bill was intrigued and said, hey, why don't you come sit in our booth at the games, 2010, first year in Carson, and let's see how your ropes do. And we said, all right, let's give it a shot. So really had, that was really our first public outing, you know, where we're going to sell face-to-face uh, with, with consumers. And um, so we went up to Carson, sat in the road booth. Uh, were you, you were there that year, yeah? Yep, I was out there. Okay, so I don't know if you remember that, you know, the, the, vendor, the vendor tents, because all they were then were just little pop-up tents, were right at the top of the tennis stadium, right? It was, it was mm-hmm. basically one row back-to-back of tents. So you just walk down one row, go around the other side, walk down the other row, you were done. That was Vendor Village. Uh, probably about, you know, 10 or 12 tents in a row. And all, all Rogue was doing is pretty much selling T-shirts uh, with Matt Benke, who's now like their, you know, chief financial officer or something like that. And uh, he was just slinging T-shirts. And so we sat and we sold jump ropes and rogue T-shirts. Um, so that was huge. That was a big uh, exposure for us. And, and that's when we really kind of fused the, the coaching with the product, you know, because our ropes are fixed length. Um, you know, my thing is using speed ropes back in the day, competing with our friends in the gym, you know, speed ropes are wonderful, but they were all adjustable with that little set screw, like a lot of them still are. And that would invariably come loose because of vibration and it would fly apart in the middle of a wad. And I said, well, that's completely avoidable. I don't want that to happen again. So we make ours fixed length. And the idea is if it fits you, you don't need it to adjust, right? If you know what the length should be and you're comfortable with it, you don't want it to adjust. You don't want that potential for failure. Um, so we had to ask people, Hey, how tall are you? And we'd get them a rope. We thought was, it would fit their height. And then we'd watch them jump, look at their technique and form, give them some, some tweaks and some uh, coaching cues, adjust the length to, to fit that. Next thing you know, people were hitting PRs on our demo mats and we sold out that weekend, absolutely crushed it. And, uh, it was, it was an amazing experience. And so, you know, those few things were the, the, the big things that kind of, uh, got us off and running. And the fact that we ran it out of our house for over two years, we just bankrolled money, you know, and I was, uh, you know, I was coming out of the real estate crash. I know I'm kind of like talking on and on and on, but you know, the real estate crash took us down a deep hole. So we were pretty much starting from scratch. So I was very conservative and uh, saved up a ton of money before we decided to go out and get into a commercial space, which is a space we're, we're in now. Uh, we're in about a uh, 10,000 square feet warehouse here in San Diego. So where we do everything, all of our manufacturing, assembly, admin, you know, you name it. So, so no, never took on investors. Uh, we were very well funded and very conservative and saved our money and uh, we pay for everything as we go, you know? Well, you, you went from the two of you to how many employees do you have now on staff? Uh, we are about... 12 now we were at the peak at the peak which was around 2014 2015 we had about 25 employees um and then the market kind of leveled off you know a lot more competition came came into the um uh, view and um and so we were able to kind of slow things down and and mellow back and also improve our processes a lot of it is is due to really just getting smart about how we do things in-house and streamlining and realize we could use less bodies. So we have our, we have our between 12 and 15 employees given, you know, uh, holidays. We will bring part-time help on during the holidays and, and uh, whatnot. So, yeah, so we're, we're still pretty small. You don't have to give away the, the answers to this, but over the years with, with producing more and being smarter, have you substantially been able to bring down the cost for you per rope? Um, yeah, well, I would say not necessarily over the years, actually cost keeps going up, you know, the cost of materials. So, so let me rephrase that from when I started and uh, you know, as a hobby and I was doing one-offs, I was literally going to the hardware store, buying wire, buying all the little pieces. I mean, everything I, I came up with was just off the shelf parts that I just kind of fangled together and came up with a really good uh, solution 
So that's why I don't really call myself an inventor, you know, really more of a hack. And, um, and uh, I would literally buy a jump rope at the sporting goods store that I liked the handle. So it was an existing jump rope shape. I didn't create that. And it just allowed me to integrate all of my pieces into it. And, and I liked the feel of it. I liked the ergonomics and uh, the, um, the diameter. So, you know, it used to cost me, you know, $25 to, to make a jump rope. And, and I would give those away to friends in the gym because it was just a hobby and people love what I made. And so, Hey, can you make me one? Sure. Here's, here's one 25 bucks. And, and, uh, at a, at a time I was basically losing $25 every time, like a $25 gift certificate or gift card. <laughs> so my wife looked at our bank account and, you know, we, we'd hit pretty tough times coming out of the real estate crash. And my wife goes, Dave, what are you doing? We don't have this money and you're spending so much, you know, at the sporting goods store and at the hardware store. Um, so from that point to then, you know, realizing, hey, we need to learn how to purchase things in, in bulk and get bigger discounts and, you know, that type of thing and bring the cost down. You know, at, at that point, at that pivot point, we were able to bring costs down pretty, pretty substantially. Um, but then over the years, and we've been dealing with the same providers uh for gosh you know eight or nine years we've had the same suppliers on just materials that is and you know every year those material costs go up shipping costs go up labor goes up so you know everything has been increasing to be honest with you so um you know we always try and keep our prices down so we're very slow to raise prices i hate doing that um but sometimes the, the team will get together and look at the numbers and go, Dave, we don't have a choice. You know, shipping costs is going up 20%, material costs are going up 15%, and here our prices remained, you know, the same from three or four years ago. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's interesting when it turns into a real business and you have to look at all of those other, you know, factors and, uh, you know, make those decisions. Well, one thing you mentioned were the handles. I have a question for you from a technique standpoint. You have thicker handles. Yes. Personally, with my RX rope, I like to put my thumbs on the handle. Yeah. Do you recommend that position versus a full grip? So uh, here's the thing. Personal preference. You know, it, it, if you know how to jump and you're successful and you're as good as you want to be or as good as you feel you need to be, we won't change a thing. You know, we're, we're not saying our way is the best way. However, if we're going to start somebody from – dead scratch uh we like to get thumb and index finger uh on opposite sides of the handle and then and then so really not running down the handle like you're doing if i had a handle here so you grab one of these yeah i think what you're referring to is what i do i go down the handle well i yeah. don't have the evo that's the that's the new handle. right but on, on any of them really they have these little uh indents so yeah some people like to do that um we like to promote more of this because we really gotcha. want a light, we really want a light touch, and then just a curl up, right? And we really think in terms more of of just you know not muscling it, but being more finessed, you know, and more articulate. So like when you throw a dart, you know, or if you throw a ball, and just some of those different things. When you when you swing a golf club, we really want nice sensitivity in your thumb and index finger. They do all they do the majority of the holding. The other three just do stabilize. They stabilize the handle. So when you have a nice relaxed grip that frees up the wrist and allows nice motion that allows you to integrate your other joints into the, into the equation that a lot of people take away. What I did, what I never like is this, like this is how you climb a rope, right? Right. When you yeah, yeah, for around. reference, for reference, you just have that full grip thumb outside the, the pointer finger there. Yeah. Where your thumb wraps all the way around. Like if it wraps around a pull up bar or wraps all the way around a rope climb, and reconnects with your with your and actually makes contact with your index finger that i will try and correct somebody all the time even with our heavy ropes i mean we have ropes that are uh you know a, a pound just in the cord of the cable alone is a pound and even in those i try and get people not to wrap their thumb completely around because um you just don't need that much tension and force on the handles and they have to understand the trade-off when you when you apply more pressure down distally on the end of your, you know, your hands and fingers, it creates so much tension up through the chain uh, that you're, you're prematurely fatiguing muscles that you don't need to engage. So that answers well, your question. 
Yeah, no, that definitely answers my question. You know, one one thing I think from an outside perspective, you've done really well at that businesses struggle at times is kind of stay in your lane, right? Like, like you've become, you are the go-to for jump ropes. The, you know, it's, it's not a product you need often, but the handful of times I've needed a rope. I mean, I've been lucky enough to get an RX rope many years in a row at the CrossFit games. You guys have oh, given awesome. them out over the years and I have, you know, they come in a nice pouch with nice colors referencing, you know, the CrossFit games handle. So, Although that Evo rope, I'm hoping allows me to get triple unders. But anyway, you have what, one. I, I don't have an Evo rope. No. You'll have one after this conversation. I can't believe you don't have one. Are you serious? All right, I would love we'll it. Um, but what what have been some of the decisions you've made over the years to just say, hey, this is our specialty? I mean, you've expanded out a little bit into apparel, and I know you have like gymnastic wraps and things like that. But what what has been what have you done on purpose to become that expert in, in this field? Um, so that's, I mean, that's a great observation. And the thing is, is that, you know, we didn't always do it right. So uh, the funny thing that people probably don't know is I, I actually made grips for myself before I ever made a jump rope, right? Like when I got into CrossFit, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a wuss in the sense that I love CrossFit, right? I've been doing it religiously for over 12 years, but I don't like the ancillary pains that come along with it right so like losing my skin with muscle ups uh or pull-ups to me that's pointless i i don't need to be you know mutilating my body right i'm already pushing my muscles and joints and everything so um so anytime i encountered something that really was discomforting outside you know like uh, outside of a workout per se i would try and correct it immediately because i just i'm just like i said i'm a wimp so i made grips for myself before I ever um, made a jump rope. And, you know, like I actually, so when I do muscle ups, for example, I still do false grip kipping muscle ups, okay? And because, you know. That's what I do. That's exactly yeah. how I do. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. They're just, to me, you know, doing a neutral grip muscle up takes such a, a big dynamic swing and a, and a dynamic and aggressive pull and pop to get on top, right? To flip your elbow up. Whereas, I'm just a big believer in like in increasing your, improving your leverage, right? Uh, so that false grip just dramatically improves your leverage. You add a little bit of a kip and uh, some dynamic energy to it. So I still do it that way. It's better for my old shoulders. Um, and so, you know, I made a, a muscle up grip, which was just a wrap around wrist strap with a leather piece that strictly covered up your wrist bone, right? And I've been using that since, gosh, if not late 08, because I started CrossFit early 08, so if not sometime late 08, early 09, I was making those for myself, you know? And um, and then the jump rope happened, you know, probably just after that, and, uh, and the jump rope was the thing that just kind of took off, you know, got a life of its own, and so all focus went that way. And so, um, you know, so shin guards, like rope climbs, I got tired of, of – shredding my legs on rope climbs, not having protection. I didn't wear knee sleeves, you know, back then. I still don't really wear knee sleeves, so I didn't have anything to cover up my, my shin. So I went to the Army surplus store, just kind of hunting around, um, scab like on a scavenger hunt, and not really with anything uh, in mind, you know. Like I wasn't trying to solve a problem for shin guards. I was just kind of seeing what they had, and they had these canvas gaiters that the military would wear, um, you know, canvas, that, and they – they had the old like hiking boot hooks that you're supposed to wrap your yeah. shoes place around. And it had a, a stirrup that went under the boot and buckled in. And I looked at these things. I had no clue what they used them for, but I'm like, man, these might make good shin guards. So I bought some, took them home, ripped out all those little, uh, you know, hooks, uh, shoelace hooks. And I took off the stirrup and I stitched Velcro onto it. I had my own sewing machine. So I actually sewed on Velcro wrap that sucker on. It was perfectly formed to your calf. And I'll tell you what, it was money. And so I made myself shin guards to rope climb. And um, so I, I, you know, done a lot of these little things. So jump ropes took off, got a life of their own. So all the focus went there. And then once we, you know, uh, kind of became a little bit more mainstream, um, you know, some of the, some of the 
the staff was like, Dave, you should bring out your grips. These, these are great. You should bring out your shin guards. These are great. You know, so we, we started bringing some of these other products uh, to the forefront and, uh, and trying to, you know, more mass produce them and, you know, make them look better for public consumption because the ones that I made for myself were never, you know, great looking. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so I, there was a point where we were originally RX jump ropes and we had a few other products underneath that umbrella. And I decided to rebrand RX Smart Gear because I thought our gear is just smart. It's not rocket science, you know, and, and uh, they just work really well. And so we thought that was a, a, a good name. And we were a little bit lost in there, right? Because people initially knew us as jump ropes and we had these other things and we were trying to market the other items. And our website uh, was horrible because it just, it you know, it just looked like a, a catalog of, of different products. So we had to kind of like recheck ourselves and go, you know what, you know, jump ropes is really what we're known for. It's what we're best at. I mean, we think our other products are world class in themselves. Like they do a really good job, but uh, you know, let's not overlook really what got us here. So we, we really shifted our focus back to jump ropes as being our primary mover. And, uh, and then we still have the other things there kind of in the background. So, yeah. And, and, and how do you go about that evolution of the jump rope? I mean, from the first ones you made that cost $25 that, you know, got the job done to these incredibly fast and light ropes. How much time are you spending daily? Like, are you a crazy jump rope scientist? Like watching <laughs> like Matt Frazier, you know, or Tia do double unders and like, did we get shave a second off here? Or is it just an idea pops into your head or how does that work? Yeah, really, it's uh, that's so funny. No, it, it's so much more um, dumb and simple than that. You know, I mean, honestly, uh, we were very slow to move. Like, we didn't change our product offering. As far as the jump ropes go, you know, the jump rope, the RX jump rope was the base handle with, uh, you know, four to five different cable thicknesses, right, different offerings. And, uh, and, and then our first expansion was just going a little bit heavier, you know, adding heavier cables, you know, up to a pound. Uh, so we go from one ounce up to a pound. I think we have um, we have eight different cable thickness offerings, which I think is more than anybody out there. Because um, everybody likes something different. That's what we found out. Like people with different coordination levels, you know, from a learning standpoint, people with different coordination levels respond differently, you know, because they have just a different uh, rhythm and a different bounce, you know, and, and um, all those factors, you know, will guide them to one rope that just feels better and they'll have more success with it. So having those options was key really from a learning standpoint and then going heavier was just from a stimulus standpoint. You know, it's like when you get really good at double unders uh, or when you get really good at anything, how do you create more stimulus from, from that movement? You either move faster, move longer or move heavier. Those are really the three things you could do. Right? So uh, we said, okay, let's go heavier because we already know you could, take what we have and go faster or go longer. Let's go heavier. Um, so we didn't really change our base offering other than adding more uh, cable weights really for the first, you know, five, six years, maybe seven years. And then, you know, it got to a point to where, um, and the thing is we used to always kind of market anti-speed rope because what people don't realize is speed ropes were, were designed for a very specific use. You know, I'm all about using the right tool for the right job. Speed ropes were designed for speed rope competitions where that's all they do is they jump in place, running in place as fast as they can for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and their endurance uh, event is three minutes, right? So it's a very single modality, if you will, um, and they're just going balls to the wall and, uh, a, those were not the right things to, to we, what I learned is that it was the completely opposite thing to learn with. I mean, you could teach somebody with it, but you can really speed up that learning curve if they have a little bit more resistance and can slow things down. Um, so, so I really was kind of anti-speed rope for the longest time. I mean, our jump ropes came with a light cable, same kind of speed wire, but we left the same, you know, uh, bigger handle, you know, almost inch diameter handle. And so um, it took six or seven years, five or six years, I guess, where, you know, we kind of got tired of being known as the jump rope that people learned with. People go, oh yeah, I started with an RX jump rope. That's what I learned with. It's great. 
But then I went and bought a rogue rope or bought a speed rope from somewhere else, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, so I started realizing, including our own sponsored athletes, you know, our sponsored athletes would say things like, yeah, you know, we see these other athletes are using these speed ropes in competition. And, you know, what do you think? And our answer was, well, if you know how to jump, you can jump with anything. And we know athletes can take our original RX jump rope with any wire and they can do quadruple unders with it, you know? And because we've tested it, you know, we have everybody go through and, and see what they can perform. And we, they can do connected quadruple unders with one of our thicker wires, you know, even upwards of a half pound. So if you know how to jump, you can take anything and jump with it. Um, so I really stayed hard to that, that mindset for a long time. And then we got to the point where we really thought, uh, maybe three or four years ago, I think 2017, leading up to 2017, we really thought triple unders were going to be in the games. I'm, I'm surprised we haven't seen them yet. Exactly. And I know you're, you're around the HQ uh, crew. And so you guys, you know, you, you guys are a little bit more on the inside uh, or on the inside of the fence than the rest of us. So, you know, uh, I'm buddies with Josh Everett out here. And Josh even said that Josh said, you know, I mean, this was quite a few years ago. He said, man, Castro, has said he really wants to put triple unders in the game, in the games, but he's just not sure about the judging standpoint yet, you know? That's exactly what I was thinking. The judging would be a challenge. Absolutely. You know, because honestly, judges, they judge double unders incorrectly as well. I mean, they, I talk to athletes, and I've even counted out reps at the games or at wherever at a competition, and I'm counting a particular athlete's reps. And, uh, yeah, there, people get double unders wrong a lot. Uh, and I have an opinion about that that we could discuss too. That's a whole another topic. But um, um, but anyway, so we thought, okay, triple unders coming out. You know, our our athletes are starting to make little comments. I kind of you know reading the writing on the wall. So I said, okay, screw it. I want to make the fastest speed rope on the market. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what we have to sell it for. I just want to put all of my energy and focus into that goal. Let's make the fastest speed rope on the market, or at least. When you say fastest, that's really a misnomer. The rope can only go as fast as the user makes it go, right? It's the user that generates the energy. All you can do is try and create the least amount of friction, right? Like the best environment with the least amount of friction to get the most out of the user's energy. Does that make sense? So that's what we focused on. Okay, how can we get these components to fit together so well and work so precisely that it takes the least amount of energy to create as much velocity as possible. And, and that's when we came out with the Evo, and that was really just to knock people's socks off. And, um, and so that was a little bit of a chip on the shoulder just because we were, we were like, oh, you're the beginner jump rope, you know, right. you're the jump rope. And so, uh, yeah, so the Evo took a life of its own as well. I mean, athletes, you know, athletes call us, and these are athletes, I'm not gonna name names, there are athletes that have their own equipment sponsors where their names are on a jump rope that they sell and get royalties from and they use ours they're allowed to their contracts allow them to use what they what they want in competition they just can't promote it and so we have we have athletes at the highest levels that use ours and we're grateful for that I and mean, we're super super stoked and humbled by that but but that's how good it is so if i could brag about it so well i'm excited to check it out so let, let's let's talk a little bit about teaching the, the beginner, you know, a lot of box owners, a lot of coaches listen to this and the double under is one of those things where it's like, Hey, go practice, just go practice for 10 minutes. Right. But right. what are some of the, you know, what would be your top three teaching points? If you were trying to get a, a newbie, someone that can do singles, that's, you know, starting to develop some fitness, but to be able to get them to do double unders. Super easy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, number one, they need to get a rope that, fits their stature, right? So we have, we have a very loose formula. Uh, if we can't see you in person, then we say, hey, your height plus three feet, your rope should never be longer than that. Take your height, add three feet on top of it. The cord, not including the handles, should never be longer than that. More times than not, what you'll find is if you step on the middle of the rope with one foot, and again, this is how we measure it, uh, there's a lot of different variations. I know most people like to stand on the rope with two feet, pull the handles up to their armpits. That's completely inaccurate because it's just there's too many variables you're playing with. So one foot in the rope, pull the cord up tight, bring your feet back together and stand up tall like in your jumping posture and see where the 
cord ends uh, terminate and you never want it longer than the bottom of your sternum, the base of your pec muscle, the bottom of your sternum. I don't know if, I don't know if this is, if we're, if your podcast is videoed this way, but. Well, people know where their sternums are. There you go. Exactly. Well, I hope so. So below your nipple, uh, bottom of your sternum. And invariably those two, those numbers, like your height plus three feet, uh, sometimes will be a little bit longer than that sternum under foot to sternum measurement, um, but it's pretty close. The sternum measurement is more accurate, right? And that represents almost three quarters of your body, right? Because really, realistically, all you need is your, you know, your whatever your height is, roughly the width of your body, and then a little bit of buffer for error, right? That's when you're starting off, that's what you need. And that's what accounts for height plus three feet, right? And so that's, that's our beginner level. And if the rope comes up to your sternum, that's our beginner level. From there, as you refine your positioning, you should be shrinking your rope to become, right, m much more efficient as far as Absolutely. like giving away tolerance, right? That's all you're giving away is tolerance where the rope passes over your head and under your feet and where your hands reside at the side of your body, right? That, that's what you have to, to focus on. So. That height is, is Q. A lot of people think that they, uh, they need a longer rope because their technique is bad, but what they don't understand is they're conforming their technique to a longer rope, which is making it bad, right? They're just grabbing the wrong thing to begin with and reinforcing that bad positioning, which is just moving their hands completely out and away from their body. So uh, that's number one. Number two, you gotta have a, a, a non-flexible cord or meaning a static cord that doesn't stretch, right? We're trying to eliminate that variable. So a static cord, so cable is usually the best thing for that. Sometimes there's some denser nylon type uh, ropes that don't have cable that don't stretch much. Those are okay too. Um, but a, a, a cable that's at least three ounces or a little bit heavier, between three and four ounces in weight, right? That's about three times the weight of a speed wire. Most typical speed wires, and we base it off of about a nine foot section is kind of our standard. Um, most people are shorter than that, but we just use that as kind of a catch all. And, um, and a typical speed wire is about one ounce for a nine foot section. So something that's three to three to three and a half ounces, static length that fits that height, that's gonna right away force them, if not, I like to say allow them to be in a much more ergonomic position and getting their hands you know, just draped below their shoulders. People think they're supposed, they feel like they're trying to hug themselves like they're in a straitjacket. It's not at all what you're doing. You're literally letting your arms hang, relax down by your sides, but you need to bring your hands up to find the middle of your body, which is your, your axis of rotation, right? You want an even axis of rotation when the rope passes overhead and underfoot. So you just need to anchor it at the middle of your body. That's usually right outside people's pockets, you know? right outside your, your, uh, um, your uh, below your hip bone and right at your hip crease, I should say, you know, generally in that, you know, maybe two inch, three inch gap right there. So, um, so understanding where that positioning is, is, is huge. So size of the rope, weight of the rope, understanding the spacing, you know, uh, overhead underfoot, and then the focus should be on slowing down. And the only way you slow down is by bounding higher, right? When you bound higher, you, you, you have to slow the rope. Your, your time in the air should dictate how fast the rope goes, right? People do it the other way. They try and speed the rope up and then make their bound match the speed of the rope. And the rope will outdance you every time. You can't keep up with the rope. So you make the rope match the time you give it. So if you do low double unders, rope has to move much faster to do its job in that amount of time, that amount of space. If you bound higher, then you give the rope much more time. You have to slow down, otherwise you'll overcook it. You'll, you know, a lot of people fail double unders. They don't realize this. A lot of people fail double unders by doing a two and a half. You know what I mean? They'll make the double and then they'll catch, when they land, they'll catch on the next rotation because they're overcooking the rope, right? And they can't seem to, so if they do get it, they got lucky. And you see some people that can rattle off five or 10 because they just happen to get lucky on the timing until finally the timing is just the slightest bit out of whack and then boom, they catch. And so we hear people, I know you've encountered people all the time that go, man, some days I can like do 20, even 50 double unders, then some days I can't do two. Those are the people that have no clue. They learned how to go fast at the beginning 
didn't learn how to go slow, right? So when you learn a slow, easy bounding double under, learn how to just chug the rope and control its, its pace, it's so much easier to speed up, right? And go the speed you want to go and then back it off when you want to back it off. So, um, yeah, so focusing on, we, we say it's elevate before rotate. Focus on your bound height before you worry about your rope speed. So those are the general takeaways. Yeah, you really have to be one with the rope. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, sure. and I And I know exactly what you're talking about because there have been times where you just feel like it's in slow motion, but you're, you're ticking away at double unders. And then you know that you can pick it up for either the last 10 or your last round, whatever you're doing. But the higher you jump, the more you can control your body, control your breathing, and ultimately, you know, probably have a better workout. Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're, we're big proponents for learning how to jump fast. You know, you, you should train yourself, right, to the highest degree of, okay, how fast can I go? How many reps can I go without breaking, right? That's showing coordination and precision and, and all those things. Um, but that should be by choice, right? You're choosing to train that, that modality. Um, but learning it and understanding how to just get the basics down and, and just, you know, understand some, some – like foundational structure and then progressions to build up that skill, just like teaching anything else, right? A snatch, a med ball clean, a, a pull up, muscle up, right? Everything starts with a base movement and it's broken down into components. And then as you perfect those components and start putting them together to create the whole movement, now you have virtuosity, right? Now you understand the movement. Now you can take that movement and put it to whatever intensity level you want. That's when we go faster or we go longer, or now, like, I don't know if you've played with our drag rope, but after we made the Evo, and, and people were just raving about how easy it was to do double unders, well, I thought, well, that's what I was kind of against. I don't want to make things easier. Like, exercising is supposed to be about a challenge. So we came out with a drag rope to see if we can make the slowest rope possible. It's not really heavy. It just has a lot of air drag and no swivels. So you have to work hard to get the rope around you for two rotations, you know? So, um, yeah, you know, you just, you just got to approach it like any other skill and, and approach it the smart way. The RX way. So David, that was, you know, fantastic for people just listening and learning how and also for coaches, but you know, if they're interested in checking out any of the ropes, give me all the information, you know, tell us all about where we can find the ropes and where we can order them, where we can see them on social media, everything about RX Smart Gear. Awesome. I appreciate that. Um, RxSmartGear.com is just our, our website where if you hit on the jump ropes tab, uh, you'll see all of our different offerings of jump ropes. And by the way, we're, we're trying to improve the, the, the website so that, you know, it's much more easy to navigate and get the information you need and, and uh, you know, uh, learn proper sizing for yourself and, and what the different options are best for. So, so that's a work in progress, but we're, we're pretty excited about where we're going with that. But uh, yeah, you'll see all the options on RX Smart Gear. Um, social media, the same thing. We're on Instagram, RX Smart Gear. Um, we have, uh, uh, if you're interested in any uh, coaching uh, or hosting a, a clinic at your, at your gym, uh, we have a, um, a tab on there for clinics on our website. You can click on the tab and inquire there. We also have an email coaching at rxmarkier.com. And if you uh, shoot an email there, then one of our team members can get in touch with you. And uh, we actually have a really cool thing we're excited about. We've got a, a young couple uh, that have, have been training with us for the past year that, um, you know, they, they kind of reached out and said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to, uh, live uh, in our van and drive around the country and we're we're fanatical crossfitters and you know we love your company and and we love crossfit and you know can we link up some way and we said oh yeah that'd be awesome we'd love to get you guys out on the road and have you basically be our evangelist you know just uh, talk about our brand or even our teaching method so we've been training them up for the last uh, year or so and they're going to travel around and just you know do you know, like pop-up workshops, or they'll try and plan out and set up workshops in advance, but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll roll into town and, and drop into some gyms, and if people want to do a, just an impromptu workshop, uh, you know, that night or, you know, that weekend or whatever, you know, with a little bit of lead time, uh, they'll, they'll be able to accommodate that. So uh, we're, we're pretty stoked about that because they'll, they'll uh, be out in the community mixing it up, and they're awesome young couples, so great energy, great teachers. 
uh, you know, presenting our all of our teaching methodologies. So um, that'll be that'll be fun. Well, that's really awesome to hear. It's it's exciting to see, you know, how far you and the company have come over the last eleven years or twelve years now. And I assume we'll see you at the CrossFit Games in in Madison. Yeah, of course. Looking to looking to get out there, and uh, I mean, this might be the last year in Madison, right? We don't know yet. I don't think so. I'm enjoying Madison, so I hope it stays there. But yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah. Madison is uh, has been a, a cool town. So yeah, excited to get out there, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to hang out. Well, I appreciate it. Looking forward to the Evo Rope. Hopefully, it's going to lead to a a double under PR, and I'm excited <laughs> to tell all the listeners about it. But thank you so much, David, for coming on the show. Hey, Jason, thanks for having me on, man. Great chatting with you. Thanks for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. How cool is that? There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so it becomes super simple. Some of these episodes with Fern or Todd or myself chatting with one another, we've done right within the app itself. Anchor will make it easy to distribute your podcast to all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make an awesome podcast in one place. All you have to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Come on, who doesn't have Spotify at this point? And if you were unaware, Spotify now is offering podcasts. That's right, on Spotify, you can listen to all your favorite artists, but also podcasts in one place for free. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now, best hour of their day on Spotify. You can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Premium users can even download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, something I always do before I hop on a plane. And you can even easily share what you're listening to with your friends on Instagram and other social media platforms. Here's the deal. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Spotify app Search for Best Hour of Their Day on Spotify or browse some other podcasts if you want. You can find them in your library tab. And also make sure to follow me so you never miss an episode of Best Hour of Their Day. Thanks again for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. And thanks again to our special guest. We appreciate all you guys do for us with Best Hour of Their Day when it comes to sharing our posts on Instagram, when it comes to subscribing to us on YouTube, when it comes to the constant feedback, we are grateful and we appreciate it. We are trying to build a community based on coaching development and becoming the best version of yourself. And it goes without saying that we couldn't do without all of you. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Season one of Dropping In is out We are getting tremendous feedback, and we'd love for you to check it out. Leave us a comment on there. Head over to our Instagram. Give us a follow. Like our pictures. Feel free to share anything that resonates with you. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or feedback for us, please don't hesitate. Email us, besthouroftheirday at gmail.com. Thanks again. Until the next episode, we hope you've had the best hour of your day.